frustration that you that you can hear um, coming into the room from the outside of the room. And, and this is a super interesting moment. It's a 10 minute clip that I work with and stretch and expand. And I will show you two minutes from it to give a bit of, of an idea of my thinking around um, these histories. And I hope it, you can hear it from me. <laughs> It's good. Mm -hmm. so, there's no sound now. Uh -huh. There was before when we tried it. But now uh -huh. This is what always happens. What can I do? Should I restart? Yeah, try and restart it. Let me see if there's anything I did to, but I didn't turn it off. So it should be, it should be working. Okay, I'll try to play it from within PowerPoint. Uh, if that doesn't work, I can try to play it from within uh, VLC. No, I've just probably the same now. Well, initially, it's weird. Initially, there was a sound, and now it's gone again. Yeah. Uh, someone is. No. Oh, sorry. Now it jumped. Did you hear it in the end? Yeah, in the end, yes. Okay, that's weird. Okay, I'll try again. Uh, where was I? 5.25. Can you hear it now? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 Und wir sprechen gerade darüber, ob jemand herausgeht, in seine Entbehrung zu suchen. Na, jetzt ist der Ton wieder weg. Das ist komisch. Okay, maybe we just have to live with it coming and going. I mean, the sound is quite important, but. I'm not going to waste time moving no, on. No, that's a good idea. You just maybe you can explain some of the effects. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so essentially the sound is a little bit enhanced sound uh, that you, you get in the original footage, but I, I added a bit of sound onto it to sort of enhance or, or intensify a little bit the impression that you have with the original video. So, um, yeah, so you didn't, in a sense, you didn't miss much if you didn't hear the sound. It's the sound that comes into the room from the outside and that people are sort of responding to. So. What I should say that in the 10 minute video, what's interesting is that on the level of language, there's an absolute failure uh, of these people to come to an agreement because they suddenly, not only do they have to decide in this first meeting, how are we gonna go about talking to each other and, and changing, reforming the country and so on, demo democratizing the country. Um, but also they suddenly have to deal after only two hours or so of sitting there, they have to deal with very concrete intervention and find a way of negotiating with each other and, and finding response. And they fail, um, this I can tell you at the end, the demonstration just moves on. So they kind of, they don't have to deal with it in the end, but the 10 minutes are kind of a constant back and forth. Um, instead, what you have is you have bodies that are extremely agitated and extremely animated. So what I, and, and these are the bodies of the oppositionals on the oppositional side that are animated by the sounds coming in through the window. And you have bodies that are in the middle of the re of a revolution that are essentially bodies of revolutionaries, but that are in a way not heroic and the gestures are not, um, yeah, they're not heroic gestures. 
rather what you see also is, um, and also in particular in this footage and the way it was recorded by the independent cameraman who was there, who was also a member of one of the oppositional groups and therefore placed himself in a particular position. Um, so, so, so from the angle that he's filming from, which is sort of how he positions himself politically, uh, creates an image where, as you can see, the bodies are sort of overlapping, they're merging. Um, sometimes you can't tell which hand belongs to which person or which body begins and ends where and so on. And I was very fascinated by these bodies and also by the politics that these bodies enact. And again, I found myself confronted with a lack of language uh, to talk about the politics of bodies because quite often uh, yeah, the language of historiography looks for the political on the level of language and not on the level of bodies. And this finally brings me now to Gabi Stötzer and Gabi Stötzer's work, um, which I found extremely helpful and I will go into why and how for understanding essentially the, the politics and also the forms of being collective that are enacted there at the round table. So who is Gabriele Stötzer? Um, for those who haven't heard of her, you might uh, also see her under the name of Gabriele Kachold, which was her married name. Um, she went back to her maiden name um, after her divorce. So Gabri Gabriele Stötzer, Gabriele Kachold. Um, Gabriele Kachold was born in 1953 in a small town in Thuringia in the south west of East Germany. Um, she was originally active in the literary dissident scenes of her hometown of Erfurt and then um, quickly got into political trouble, especially in 1976 after she uh, started or was very instrumental in the dissemination of an open letter that intellectuals from East Germany had were passing around in support of um, Wolf Biermann. Wolf Biermann was a communist dissident singer-songwriter singer -songwriter who had gone to West Germany for a concert and then was suddenly not allowed back into the country, was expatriated against his will. And so the sort of intellectual, many intellectual figures in East Germany took a stance against this expatriation and Stelze organized the dissemination of this letter in in Erfurt and was arrested for defamation as a result, which is quite a serious charge. Um, so she was sent to, to jail. Um, she was sent to Horneck, which is quite infamous women's prison in East Germany, also in Thuringia. And the time there, she spent about a year there, was uh, quite formative for her practice, um, especially her encounters with the other women who she felt absolutely didn't fit with an idea, with her idea of or the, the sort of idea she had grown up with of, of how women are and what women are, and also forms of solidarity between women that she encountered there. So um, she, she herself says actually about her time in jail, my whole image of the GDR and of women collapsed at once. And after her release, um, this had quite a dramatic impact on her practice, so she uh, stopped working as a, no, she didn't stop working as a writer, but she did add to, to her writing practice and focus more on, on an artistic practice as a sort of self-taught artist. She began working in film and performance. Um, she began working with other people in collaboration, and she in particular started working with um, women. So let's look at some of her works from the 80s, um, early 80s. So, um, well, 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 let's look at this one first. Um, so this one, in this one, um, we see Gabriele Stötze herself, um, as you can see, sort of gesturing, the work is also called gestures, uh, with her hands in front of her face and her body. Um, in this case, the picture was taken by Connie Schleimer, Cornelia Schleimer, who's also an important East German um, artist in her own right. So the collaboration here was between the friend taking the pictures and her performing in front of the pictures. This um, changed um, quite quickly to uh, a practice where she was often behind the camera and help photographing, documenting other women that she invited to join her 
um, to interact with their own bodies and each other in front of the camera. And the, the product that we see today is of these, these sort of picture collages. Um, so here we have two women, uh, few, let's say, merging themselves, fusing themselves with bandages uh, called wrapping from Einwicklung from 1982. Or another way of dealing with bodies um, or sort of, yeah, processing bodies was this way where she takes pictures of naked bodies and then <laughs> merges them afterwards in the prints, in this case, by painting over them, painting lines and so on. So, um, and this is another collage of different pictures with different interactions where again, we have a person um, marking parts of their body. Um, uh, we have someone, we have some pictures with bodies being crossed out and then being crossed out also fused together. Um, yeah, and the bodies being sort of fragmented and fused um, in different ways. Uh, also sort of very vulnerable bodies and the sort of, yeah, I don't know if you see the connection with my work, but for me it was, yeah, there was something in the sort of way that bodies are fused together and disassembled and reassembled in, in these pictures that I found relevant and uh, for thinking through the bodies at the round table. And now if we look at these bodies um, through the art, art historical vocabularies that we have um, and that I talked about earlier as being inherited from the Cold War, then uh, I found it interesting how the body kind of appears in, in, in these, in these uh, yeah, languages of art history and, and the sort of binary between, on the one hand, the collective body, the sort of state socialist collective body, on, on the other hand, the sort of free Western autonomous individual and which in the art field tends to correspond with, um, yeah, on the one hand, socialist realism, which I took kind of random example here. This is a mural from Dresden, um, where we have um, uh, de-individualized bodies in a collect presented in a collective as part of as part of a collective, quite individual, uh, de-individualized. And on the other hand, they're supposed to be the autonomous body, right? The, the sort of independent, bounded, self-contained uh, body. Here we have a quite proud, self-contained, uh, quite happy body. However, this is not the Western free liberated individual and it's also not a Western artist um, producing this image, but this is, as you can see, an image by Willy Zitter, who you might probably be familiar with as the, probably most famous and probably also most reviled um, East German sort of state artist. So we can see that the sort of dichotomy that in particular Western art history applies to Eastern um, practices um, with state socialist collective on the one hand and free individual and the autonomous body on the other doesn't really quite apply. And especially it doesn't apply to Stutz's images who where we have bodies that are certainly not uh, contain, self-contained, autonomous, um, invincible, heroic, or what have you in any way, but rather that are, as I said, fragmented, in this case also torn, manipulated by other people in relation to other people. Um, a few more examples here. Yeah, we have again a body that is kind of constricted. She's pressing her face against a pane of glass, so she's coming up against a, a boundary, a limit, a, a frontier, if you want. Um, do I have one more? Ah, oh, yeah. And <laughs> finally, there is a bounded, a bound individual here, but the binding or the boundness and the containment is uh, is actually in a, in a mummy, in a bandage. Um, and another thing that one should stress about these bodies, and I don't know if you see it from the examples that I've shown now, um, I think there's often, a, I find a misunderstanding about Judge's work, which is to assume, which is half true, but not entirely true, which is to say that these bodies are, because they're fragmented and wounded and vulnerable, 
are an expression of state violence and repression. Um, but actually, just it doesn't talk about the bodies that way, and I also don't see them that way. Um, for example, about the mummy, she writes not in terms of constriction, which one might also expect, but in terms of, I, I just read the quote. I wrapped the whole body in bandages as a wound until it turned into the final classical shape of an Egyptian mummy that brought a promise of aesthetic healing along with it. So the bandage is actually the healing, it's not the constriction. And I find this very interesting, it sort of goes really strongly against this idea of liberation through the autonomous individual. Um, because I think if one can say one thing about Stetzer's practices, uh, it is that the liberation that I really feel is strong in these interactions, the sense of liberation and self-determination, um, then it's very much not achieved by individuals on their own alone, but is always achieved by decentering oneself and going into relation. Um, I read a quote from Stutzer that I think makes this um, beautifully clear. Mm. The bodies of idea, ideas, paper, celluloid, enter the real world, a process of selection becomes possible and begins. The discovery of the other within oneself brings with it more than just the possibilities of the images connected to it. It brings also the general forces and multiple forms of the usable self. It creates a new confidence to enter one's own real context, to enter one's real context, social context as an active figure, or to expose oneself again and again to the horror and the joy of the existential other, the art of gliding along the water's edge between and above and the below, releasing again and again the deep sound of the barge pole touching the ground. So we have a way of working that is very much about, yeah, confrontation with the other and sort of exploring oneself um, in relation and also in being constrained um, in, in, by reality and also by this encounter with the other, which not only puts uh, Stürzer at odds with the socialist realist conception of, of the self and, and, and of art, but also put her in confrontation with um, the counter image that is called a called up or not only by sort of Western observers, but in part also by the her underground peers themselves, where the idea that I sort of mentioned earlier of the counterpart of the socialist collective body was also the heroic male connotated um, individual body. So how does this look in, in the sort of under underground, I don't know, that's not a good word, but the so-called non-conforming art, the non let's say the non-socialist realist art, if you want. Um, there's some random examples that I that I pulled off the internet today and I'm not super familiar with any of these people's work, um, but you get the idea there is a sort of suffering male figure here on the one hand on the level of content of the pictures and on the level of production, which is beautifully exemplified by this photograph. Um, you also have this idea of the sort of bohemian, yeah, artist, romantic artist figure, of course, connotated as, as male. And um, this is the kind of art that um, there's probably absolutely nothing wrong with it. And I'm probably doing an, an, it an enormous uh, injustice by sort of just using it now as a negative example of male connotated art. but. What I can say from my experience, and I think it resonates a little bit with what I see in Stötze, is that, I mean, this was very much the, the idea of a, of a sort of dissident body as it circulated in the, in the sort of dissident critical uh, scenes that I also grew up with and that I, even at the time, found quite oppressive. And um, from a sort of proto-feminist, I guess, <laughs> sensibility, um, which brings me to a book that I would like to refer you to because I'm not going to be able to go too much into the sort of feminist critique of, of the East German underground, but Angelika Richter has done that job um, in, an, in a sort of excellent way in the book that came out in 2019, Das Gesetz der Szene, uh, the, the Law of the Scene, where she writes about this sort of problem of the 
idea that you can escape uh, the constraints of state socialism by escaping into this sort of artistic subjectivity, bohemian subjectivity, which then is a sort of gendered masculine subjectivity. Um, and in fact, I'm also showing this book cover because the title itself is taken from a text by um, Stötzer, where Stötzer herself reflects, um, which she does time and time again in her, in her work, in her writing, in her interviews, and also in her art practice, where she sort of, um, yeah, talks about, talks about the sort of fallacy of, of, of or let's say not the fallacy, but of her experience of, of, of seeing this kind of bohemian artist model, not as a form of escape, but as, as yet another layer of repression that she experienced as a, as a female underground artist. Um, <clears throat> so coming back to, ah, yeah. Let's let's just sort of ground this back again to the to the sort of starting point of the round table, just to say that the bodies that I find in Stötzer's work, the sort of non-heroic, open, uh, disoriented bodies, for me were really helpful for understanding the dissident bodies that I see at the round table and in the book chapter that I'm taking this this talk from. Um, I look at different ways uh, through Stötzer and and other. Um, yeah, the theory of Bakhtin, for example, and how, how more concretely it's sort of what qualities this dissident bodies have. And I'm not going to unfortunately have time to go into that in greater detail, but I wanted to, if we have time, and I'll try to make it quick, um, talk about another aspect of her work that I find particularly relevant, both um, if we talk about new approaches to, to art history, East German art history, and also in relation to, to my own work about 89, and that's um, Stötzer's relationship to reality and realism. So, of course, you know that, that the sort of official dogma, doctrine of, of art was uh, socialist realism in the way that we've seen earlier, no? the mural or Zitter's paintings. Um, <clears throat> and again, we have a underground, if you want, response to it, um, which I, I just, again, use these two, these three pictures, um, which was the sort of go to underground response to this, which was to sort of um, escape into sort of a kind of timelessness on, and to move away from, from reality, either by going into some sort of allegorical or sort of symbolic um, figures, quite decontextualized or indeed going into abstraction and a kind of neo-expressionist abstraction. So in whatever way to get away from reality as much as possible. Um, and, and also being, as Havel calls it, anti-political. So saying we're not dealing with politics, um, which is of course a political statement in this context. Um, and I would like to, um, show you another work by Stutzer, another short video clip, because I think um, it exemplifies her relationship to reality, or let's say to the present and to futurity in a really interesting way. And it's also a really wonderful video, as I think I'll show you. And let's see, this, it would be nice if we have sound for this, but if not, I can tell you that the sound was also added on later, so it also works, I think, without sound, but let's hope it works. Is there sound? Um, to sleep. No, I don't think so. No. Mm -mm. No. What is the sound, uh, Eske? What would it be? <laughs> the sound is actually just um, atmosphere. 
So a sound recordings that she made an effort and it's basically <laughs> for me an absolute childhood sound of the 1980s. It's the sound of trams going up and down and screeching in the in the tram tracks and people walking about and talking. It's, it's just sort of atmosphere and I think she shot this in Super 8, so I think the original footage doesn't have sound and this sound collage was added on. Maybe you could later, but oh. sorry. I guess for my purposes, it's interesting that it's such an everyday sound. That's maybe what I would say about it. Maybe you could say um, a word about the title because I'm not sure people understand. Fight sure. Yeah, Fight Sons, Fight Sons is a, is a sort of play on words, which is something that Stretzer is very fond of doing. Um, Fight Sons is a kind of pagan, I think it would be, would be right to say. Uh, pagan dance from actually pagan middle ages doesn't really fit together it's, it's i think it's a medieval thing the sort of probably pagan roots where people dance themselves into ecstasy especially in the i think it's a tradition from the hearts mountains which is near nearish uh where where um, Stresser lived and feig's dance is a play on that and um, the word feig's and means to laugh uh that's it already a few more things that i can say about this maybe for understanding is that she in this case um, quite often she worked with the same people, which later then became her women's artist group in Erfurt. But in this case, she also went, just went around the streets of Erfurt and asked random people in the street if they wanted to participate. And the instruction to people was very simple. She just said them, pick a place and start dancing and dance yourself into ecstasy. And this is what people came up with. And I love it in, in, in many ways also because her feminism obviously extends to including men in the picture and what I also like um, on this sort of question of realism of the realism of her work is that unlike maybe the paintings that we looked at uh, the the sort of the present of the lady there is very clearly indexed in 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 this work through the clothes and through the through the places and through the sounds which you couldn't hear but which was an extremely everyday normal sound and that also a, a sound of its time for me uh, very much so so if we want to talk about escape or liberation and I think the work is very liberating um, and it shares a, an experience of liberation between different people also among the performers, then it's not a way of denying or moving as far away as possible from reality or the present, but rather intensifying the present and sort of being, they're also in, in very, very close contact with their surroundings and, and through this dancing themselves to ecstasy, I feel that the sort of present is intensified until it sort of reaches something else, something beyond itself. And this for me was again, really crucial in understanding what is happening there at the round table where again, I feel the sort of movement of bodies is very much about intensifying a particular moment that is already quite intense. And um, just to sort of slowly come to an end, but what I find interesting in Stretch's work and in relation to my work is the way that it sort of signals towards the future and she talks about um she very much talks about her works in, in terms of the signaling an expression of something she could not yet say how do i get out of this um so this is one quote for example um so now I had these images within me and they were definitely not of this reality and were therefore proof of the existence of a portal within me towards another reality. This other reality was not the West. So, right, again, we have this sort of undercutting of the dichotomies of this sort of Cold War thinking. So 
it's not the state, it's, it's not to say state socialist reality, but it's also not the Western reality. Um, <clears throat> and my sort of strong feeling is, and I can sort of back this up with a few other works of Stötzer, is that the reality that these experiments, collective experiments were actually working towards was the reality and the future that shortly became present for a brief for a brief moment in the 89 revolution at at the round table at the assemblies in the streets in the places where people became collective in this sort of undefined and intensified way um, to back this up a little bit, like I said, with this a work which I find fascinating from 1989, which Schützer made as part of the group that she founded, the Künstlerinnengruppe Erfurt, which in fact was called Signals, Signale, and was made in the spring of 1989. So just before, at a time where the revolution was imminent, but could not have been predicted. And in the video, I took these photos in an, a recent exhibition at the NGBK in Berlin, of the work of the women's group. Uh, so they're not fantastic photos. And I, for this talk, I would have also taken other ones, uh, but they're basically sort of signaling towards a future which then suddenly happens. And she says, signals was about something that was out of my reach. Um, it called on something not yet speakable. By this point, I was behind the camera. I called forth the vision of the not yet speakable. Um, we, we knew nothing of what would come in the autumn, but our work seems to have been divinatory. And so here we are in the autumn of 89, and I was sort of round off here um, by saying that um, Stötze's work is also fascinating in the sense that when the revolution came, she was absolutely ready for it. And her group quickly formalized, out of her artist group, they quickly formalized a, a political group, the Women for Change in Erfurt. Um, this picture is again from this exhibition at the NGBK. Um, we see her on the far right giving a speech in front of the town hall in Erfurt. And I will finish by, if you permit, by reading quickly a few lines from my own book, which I will end with that brings us back to the round table. During the months of uprising that followed the micropolitics of Stutzer's work and the macro, macropolitics of her re-emerging activism merged into one, her long-standing collective practice met as if it was made for it, the radical requirements of the day. The aesthetically mediated forms of being collective that Stutzer's collaborations had been fostering and elaborating for years could now also and finally begin to be inhabited outside of her art. The gestures of the signaling hands in her work find their communicability beyond small circles of her groups, at least for a short moment in time. On December 7th, the effort women's communicate, communicating hands and bodies were answered by the fluttering hands of the dissidents that move and signal at the round table with and beyond the words they speak signaling towards a new way of being collective and of being political that is getting a feel for itself in the confrontation of the bodies inside and outside, a liberation and becoming collective differently, this time at a societal scale. That's it. <laughs> and now I look forward to your questions <laughs> and to explaining anything that I missed or went too fast um, because of, yeah trying to get through this in, in record time. Um, no, I think it worked very well. Thank you so much, Elske, for this excellent talk, um, you know, full of useful information and, and images. And um, yeah, we have, a, we have some time for questions and, and comments. And um, Sarah Blaylock already raised her hand, so please go ahead. Hi, hi, Oscar. Thank you so much. Um, nice to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah. Um, so much. <laughs> yeah for sharing this and um, and sharing this extreme interest in Gabby Stutzer's work. And um, I'm curious about um, how you're translating that collaborative quality of her work. You're going in and out, Sarah, somehow. Maybe it's just- Into the she really environments that you're working or, yeah, thanks. In, in my own practice? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a super good question, because I mean, it's always difficult. How do you, I mean, not that I said about updating her 
sort of thinking that I would like to update her practice. But of course, I think about to what extent um, are the methodologies that I use in my own art also in line with the contents of it, namely this sort of dissident, these dissident cultures um, to which I would, in which I would include Gabi's work. And um, so I don't work collectively in the same way that Gabi does, um, but I see, on the one hand, I also see all of my work as a sort of offer for conversation and for, for sort of finding a language uh, for certain things together. So I often show this footage from the 89 from the round table and, and use it as a way of getting into conversation. So it's a very different way. It's, it's a very different, um, it works very differently if I show it to people that were also protagonists from when I show it to people that were not protagonists. But but the idea of the of the work is to trigger a kind of collective thinking and speaking. Um, I do have formats that are more interactive. So, for example, the scene that I showed you at the beginning with the bodies moving, this kind of weird choreography. I've done workshops around that. Um, that have a little bit the same impulse, which is to do together a close reading of the of the footage. So I get people, and I've done this in absolutely vastly different contexts, ranging from uh, an art at the University of Delhi um, to a group of activists in Romania to a seminar seminary and um, a tutorial in in, in Vienna. And so on, and um, we look at these movements frame by frame and write scripts of the movements together and talk about that and then reenact together. And that's another way of, of getting into conversation ab about and approaching this political moment in a sort of physical way. Maybe that is enough for the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elske. There's another question by uh, Jen uh, Jennifer Jensen. Please go ahead. Yeah, Elska, thank you so much. This is so interesting. Um, I work a lot on, on embodiment and violence, um, particularly violence as like a potentially generative practice. So I was really intrigued by the images that you showed us from Gabriela Stutzer, um, particularly the idea of the, the bandages um, mm -hmm. wrapping around the body mm -hmm. and the quote that you shared that mm -hmm. the the she's wrapping the body in bandages as a wound. Um, and I, I do find it compelling your, your claim that it doesn't seem to be about a kind of violence or reaction to state violence necessarily, or an idea of um, restriction. But I'm wondering, what is what do you think is the source of that wound then? Like why the recurrence of the bandages and this imagery? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking mm -hmm. the image of Einwicklungen um, and Verschmelzung and Mumie. And then also um, the, the cover on Angelika Richter's book. Um, and then Cornelia Schleimer, her video Unter Weißen Tüchern, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Like what, yeah. what, are, what are the bandages doing here and what, is the, what are they responding to? Mm. Well, I mean, obviously they, they are responding to state violence. I mean, I'm not debating that if, if that was the impression then that's not, no, it's, it's certainly, I mean, the, the violence that that's experienced, uh, especially during, uh, well, in, in jail and also in all sorts of different ways through the surveillance that she was exposed to afterwards continuously and and the sort of attacks on her through through stasi informants and and also attempts to manipulate her and so and so on and so forth um is is real and i think that is also the subject of those works um what i find important to stress is that the works don't stop there because they're often invoked and interpreted and I think also Gabi is often called upon to speak as a victim of state violence and I find that problematic and also not adequate for capturing her work because what we see I think the sort of self-victimization we see in in some of the works by the by the male artists that I've shown this kind of uh, repressed uh, suffering uh, I don't see it stopping and suffering in Stretzer's work what I see is that she takes the wound, the wound and she works with the wound and there's something by 
sort of working around the wound and the vulnerability and and the the trauma that that moves it into something else and this is what i find the absolute strength of her work and I'm not even sure that I would call it purely therapeutic in, in that sense, even though others have claimed that her work is could be seen as therapeutic. But I think I think it is artistic, but I think it sort of works from an experience of repression and violence, but but moves beyond beyond is maybe the wrong word, because can you ever, but it sort of works it through without leaving it behind, if you see what I mean. And and it and it as it, as it of produces a liberation, which I think she very much felt. I think for her jail, this is my my feeling. The way she talks about it is that jail was absolutely traumatizing, but it was also absolutely formative um, for her pers personality and her absolute fearlessness, which which she has in in the way she deals to this day with um, with the world. Uh, thank you, Eske. Yeah, um, if I may just interject, because I think what mm -hmm. I wanted to say has some bearing on this, the, mm -hmm. the last few things you said. Um, I really appreciated your remarks because they, so one of, it seems like one of the major problems for observers of art, not just from East Germany, but from Eastern Europe in general, is to see it purely as reactive, right? As a reaction to censorship, a reaction to pressure from the state and so forth. And this really limits your this limits your possibility as somebody who you know who wants to somehow come to terms with this work to purely see it as reactive because then your only frame of reference will always ever be state power, and I think this locks uh, the artists into an unfortunate um, yeah into an unfortunate bind, um, um, and it's very difficult once you're in that to get out of that because mm -hmm. anything they do can suddenly become you know can become can be interpreted within that frame. And I found it quite remarkable that so many of the works you've shown, um, while they certainly could be interpreted that way because most things can, um, they also go beyond them. And I was particularly struck by the fact that it wasn't probably coincidental that photography plays such an important work in Stretzer's uh, oeuvre. Uh, so she, she, hers is a, is a very conscious um, work with media, with technical media. And specifically, it's an exploration, it seems not just of suffering and, and other expressive uh, features, but, but also quite um, sort of pointedly a, a formal engagement with um, uh, questions of repetition, for example, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the photos you showed us um, were formally quite uh, remarkable in, in that they, mm -hmm. they, they multiply repeated the same image, sometimes the same, sometimes a manipulated image, sometimes showing different poses. But this concern with repetition led me to think that it's perhaps not enough, as is so often the case when we deal with art from East Germany in particular, to reduce it to um, the moment of expression. Yeah. So while, of course, there is something expressive here, no question about that, but uh, it does seem as if she has strong um, formal concerns, um, concerns to do with exploring the medium that she is dealing with, that actually exceed this idea of, um, yeah, that exceed the idea of expression, which is ultimately the, the sort of ultima ratio of any interpretation that locks Eastern German artists and artists from Eastern Germany, uh, from Eastern Europe more generally into the sort of, is the, you know, the repressive uh, kind of dilemma. So I was curious about whether, and, and this may be too seemingly too art historical, but it, it, I wonder if this idea that there are formal concerns at work here um, that exceed the purely expressive, if that's something that you would, that you would be willing to, to explore and that you find interesting in a work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I would have to <laughs> stress again that that probably my my approach is less art historical um, than, than some of yours. So um, I would probably be stretching or sort of thinking a bit too much on my feet if I was to give now a sort of aesthetic analysis of 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 her methodology because I haven't, to be honest that's not the approach to it that I take. I, I take I take it as a sort of art, more as a sort of 
political practice rather than as a set of aesthetic concerns. Um, so what I find interesting is where I see certain methods that I'm intuitively also drawn to as an artist, such as repetition or such as this kind of seemingly quite sober documentary photographic or archival sort of it's a sort of self archiving that she does you know with the with the images as well and these are sort of old practices that I uh, find myself drawn to instinctively and I think there's something there um, in that that I find instinctively interesting and for sure Stratzer is a strong aesthetic um, premise or, or setting or statement that she makes with the with the way she works with performance, which of course hundreds of people, thousands of people, performers and art historians grapple with all the time is how, what's the relationship between a live performance and a documentation. And one could probably interrogate, interrogate that with Stelzer as well. But the, the sort of way that she's found of sort of very uh, dryly charting uh, or archiving or indexing these different gestures is something that resonates with me quite strongly because I, I work with archival footage and yeah but the, the image you see now is is a bit this is not an artwork this is just something I threw together for, for to end the slideshow but the sort of indexing of of movements um is something that I sort of yeah I can see that there's some sort of <laughs> correspondence to what to what Jutsu is doing I'm not sure if I'm answering your question but <laughs> But that's as far as I can take it, I think, on the question of um, aesthetics. And I, I'm, I'm sure there, I mean, that's the, the, the beauty about the work of Stötzer is that, that it, it's, still, it's, it's still open for, I think, a really rich art historical analysis on all these levels. And I would really wish for her work to be seen through all these different lenses, not just the lens that I bring, which is a political one, but also the, a mainly political one but also the lenses that art historians can bring that can appreciate her work as art in its own right, because I think we have to be very careful not to see her work as often happens with Eastern European art as an art, as a historical artifact or as an ethnographic, quasi-ethnographic, I think Edith Anders wrote once uh, that works from Eastern Europe are treated as sort of artifacts that sort of testimony to social reality under socialism and and I think they deserve to be treated as artworks in in all the, in all the ways that that implies which of which I think my way is one way but not the only way yeah definitely no all that made perfect sense to me um there was a, another question by Isotta but she may have uh, well uh, I I'm, yeah hi everybody good to see everybody uh, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. You already started to touch on that, but you talked about the, her prison experience as uh, formative. And I think you said it earlier on during your talk that uh, uh, she uh, understood she had a different sense of what uh, her idea of women didn't fit, mm -hmm. something like that. I'm sorry if I cannot quote mm -hmm. it. And so that changed their perception of female womanhood or what? Can you explain what, what you meant with mm -hmm. that sense? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, <laughs> that's another, um, that's another way into Stress's work is of course the feminist perspective, um, which again would, I think that would be a whole uh, 10 PhDs um, or more um, to look at the feminism within Stress, which I some also sort of touch on in my work, but on a very limited, way um, but um, it's super complex because even the word feminist applied to East German art practices needs needs unpacking but regarding your question about what I said about her experience of prison um, I mean she voices this very clearly in interviews that she gives about her time in prison which is that way also in the books and 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 quotes quotes of hers in, in books where she says that um, she grew up um, with essentially two images of what a woman is um, that were prevailed in East Germany at the time of her growing up. Uh, one was the 
petty bourgeois bourgeois German image of a woman, a sort of petty bourgeois or bourgeois woman, and there's an expression in German, and a Frau aus gutem Hause, so well behaved, well trained female. So, you know, all this sort of uh, things commonly associated with the woman as a sort of a polite, caring, uh, well behaved, gentle, and so on character. And alongside that, there was the socialist. Um, a state socialist conception of what a woman had to be, which was um, different from the bourgeois one, but sort of not replacing it entirely, but more sort of planted on top of the on top of the previous bourgeois concept of a woman, which was the idea of the woman worker, a kind of, uh, if you want, defeminized, if you want to say that, also masculinized. Bini Adamchak writes a lot about this sort of conception of, of women under state socialism. The woman as a worker, the woman as as a sort of socialist um, new human, um, and and the sort of the the hard the sort of hard work the worker alongside motherhood and, and and all these sort of conceptions. These let's say the added layer of ascriptions and demands that were placed on women in East Germany without necessarily cancelling out the previous uh, ascription to women. And what she uh, to what to what a woman is or should be, and what happened in 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 prison was that she so this prison in in Hohenegg is interesting because it was a women's all women's prison, and it was a mixture of criminals so called criminals and political prisoners. So she was there with a handful of other political prisoners and criminals, and um, <laughs> and I think she was quite. The, the encounter with the criminals especially confronted her bourgeois um, self uh, in the sense that these were women that were not feminine in a, in a sort of classic bourgeois way. They were rough, they were criminal, they were murderous, they were um, often lesbians, um, they were beating each other, they were having sex with each other, they were trying to poison each other. And at the same time, there was a great solidarity that she learned to appreciate. Um, and I, there's another uh, scene that I use in my book where she, it's maybe too much to go into, but where she talks about a, a sort of formative experience that she had there where the women suddenly made a lot of noise to support her when she was in pain. And uh, you hear the, the sounds of the other women through the prison walls. And so, so in that sense, I think this sort of this combination of traumatizing and formative um, um, is is present there in terms of also her conception of herself as a woman. So in the sense that there's there was something frightening about these these women, but also something liberating about simply the fact that she had that was now suddenly a lot more models of what woman being a woman could mean, and. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but I also don't want to overinterpret her encounters. But but she does talk about these two, these two conceptions of womanhood and the third one that she learned about in jail. So maybe leave it at that. Thank you, Elske. Thank you. Yeah, and so we don't exceed our hour that we normally allocate too much. Um, I think we're limited to to these questions, but um, I'd like to thank you again for being here. Thank you everybody for attending this talk. Thought it was immensely enriching and um, yeah thanks very much and I look forward to the next installment in this series which would be Sarah Blaylock from the University of Minnesota uh, in May and um, we'll send out a notice about that talk uh, in due course and in the meantime thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>
Wo soll die hingehen? An welche Rechnungsadresse? Ja, das schicke ich dir, genau. Ich Schickst sage dir die Adresse, okay. an, an, an die das geschickt werden muss. Genau. Also das heißt, du schickst es an mich, aber die kann dann adressiert werden. Das schicke ich, welche, mhm. welche Adresse wir benutzen. Mhm. Und ja, und ich, wenn du Interesse hast, schicke ich dir einfach die Ankündigungen für die nächsten. Ähm, Sehr gerne, ja. Also würde ich auf, auf jeden Fall gerne. Und es wäre toll, wenn du vielleicht kommen könntest oder so. Und mhm. äh, vielleicht, ja, vielleicht begegnen wir uns mal, wenn ich das nächste Mal in Berlin bin oder so. Sehr gerne, ja. Ja? Schön, ja, wunderbar. Vielen Dank nochmal für die Einladung. Es war jetzt, ist immer blöd bei Zoom, weil man so wenig Gespür dafür bekommt, wie das im Raum ist und wie die Leute das wahrnehmen, aber kann man nicht ändern. Also das stimmt. Man kann es nur daran messen, wie viel die Leute fragen und äh, die Diskussion war sehr gut, fand ich. Das stimmt. Also das insofern, stimmt. Wenn, ich, also wenn man es daran misst, was wirklich hätte es nicht besser laufen können. Hm. Ja. Okay? Super. Dann Alles schönen klar. Tag. Danke, Elske. Guten Abend und ja. guten Abend. Tschüss. Ja.